Recording in progress. Greetings, shalom. So I am super hyped this morning. I'm coming again impromptu with another unplanned offering that has been inspired by a conversation that I was having with a beautiful, beloved sister of mine. Oof. So I'm going to just dive right in. This morning, interestingly enough, I, I woke up. Now, usually I wake up with a praise in my heart. <laughs> usually, no, seriously, I, I wake up and hear, you know, different praise songs uh, when I start my day. But sometimes certain other songs come to my mind <laughs> or quotes or different thoughts. And so for some reason this morning, I woke up hearing the line from Cardi B, the WAP, the WAP song, where she says, broke boys don't deserve conjugal pleasures. <laughs> We'll put it that way. And in a sense, she's right. In a sense, she's right. However, it's not for a woman to presence this to a man. I firmly believe that men should emphatically direct other men to the understanding of their worthiness to possess a woman and their readiness to pursue a woman. Other men should be accountable and responsible for rallying together to teach other men, especially young men, that they are not ready to experience the pleasure of a woman if they have not established their manhood. So let me clarify that. What, what we have lost in modern society are our ancestral rites of passage and our proper traditional family community order, which includes separation and segregation of the sexes and genders for selected periods of time while skills are developed. And this goes for young girls and young boys, young men and young women. In indigenous societies, African societies, ancestral societies, young men did not live with their mothers forever. They did not live among women their whole lives. In many societies, even to this day, young men at the age of puberty are separated and live among the men who then teach them and develop their manhood and with whom they embark upon rites of passage and manhood journeys, ordeal journeys uh, that strengthen them physically, mentally, emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually, and even to a degree financially, or equip them with the capacity and capability to establish a home for themselves and their future families. There's a process that's been lost in modernity and, and after generations of toxic family dysfunction and disruption and in the consequence of enslavement. So much has been lost. And to be honest, for all of us men and women, Time is not on our side in modernity. So many of us are decades behind men and women. So this conversation uh, that I was having with my beloved sister was centered around courtship initially and the delineation between dating and courtship. And I believe that dating is a process a beautiful process of experimentation. And I'm not talking about sexually. See, these days we have it confused that dating is just going out with people, having sex with them, being intimate with them in different ways without even knowing them. No, dating is a process of vetting people, 
It's experimenting with dynamics. It's experimenting with and in the playground of coming to know yourself, coming into womanhood and or manhood through playing with the dynamics of different men and women. And so it's almost like after reaching a certain age of post-adolescence, you know, the same way we as children experiment with finding out how to make friends. It's kind of that on a more mature level. We just experiment with different personalities as we are discovering our own personality, growing into independence, growing into adulthood. So again, we have to remember in the ancient times, men and women were not together the same way they are now. Young men and young women were not together in the same spaces as they are now. Even schooling was separated and segregated. They were all boys schools. They were all girls schools. Young girls went through rites of passage. See, we have to remember we late, we are late in modernity. Young men and young women at far younger ages were very well established and equipped with the understanding of how to run households and families. Young women that we would consider even children these days were already trained in how to keep a home, how to sew their own clothes, how to make their own food, how to harvest food, how to prepare it, how to preserve food, how to cook, how to clean. At very young ages, they were already ready. These are rites of passage. This is training in real life skills. And this was done at a far younger age than it is now. And likewise for young men, young boys, who we may, again, still think of as children these days, were already equipped. They knew how to care for animals. They knew how to till the ground. They knew even things, carpentry, mechanics, like these are real things that we we don't learn anymore. We don't teach our children anymore. And one thing I fully believe for me, for me, for my standard, if a man is not able to literally know how to build a home from the ground up and install plumbing, if a man is not able to locate and uh, fresh water and dig a well, to draw fresh water from, he's not a man yet. That's just for me, like I said, and that may be extreme to some, but especially in these times when modernity is failing and falling, technology ain't gonna cut it. There is a time coming when currency, that physical literal dollar will not mean a thing. And the ability to protect, protect and provide will be contingent upon the work of man's hands and the sweat of his brow. Really, in real time. Not how good he can hustle or market. Not how many hours he can sit down in a corporate environment in front of a computer screen or put up a PowerPoint. Not how many computers he can program. No, sir. Not in the times to come that are coming up very soon. So manhood should, should return back to the standard of what can you do with your hands? If you don't know how to put seed in the ground and all you know is how to put seed in some woman's vagina, you're not a man. real practical skills. Do you know how to fix a car? It's not good enough to just say you have enough money to go pay for overcharge, pay to be overcharged for one. Cause let's be, let's just be real. Capitalism and consumerism is simply capitalizing off of ignorance and laziness. So every business that we can think of is overcharging you for something that you could do for yourself. We go to stores and buy clothes. Let's not even talk about the, the synthetic fabrics that are 
corrupting our DNA and disrupting our endocrine system and putting our hormones out of balance. Let's not even talk about that. And how we wearing all these mixed fabrics and synthetic fabrics that are a detriment to our vibration as electromagnetic beings. Let's not even talk about that. But let's talk about how we are being overcharged for inferior made clothing because we too lazy to sew our own clothes from real fabrics and engage in that skill, that artistry that's real. Because when everything hits the fan, human beings will always need clothes. Human beings will always need food. Human beings will always need shelter and houses. And who among us, men and women, have real life skills to facilitate and maintain that when there is no technology, there is no industrialization, there is no physical currency to rely on. And we are being overcharged for our ignorance and laziness and also being willingly complicit in our own poisoning through the food, through the clothes, through mm -hmm. industrialization through the corruption of the environment, the pollution of the earth, we are complicit in poisoning ourselves and the earth for laziness and ignorance. Because we don't know how to grow our own food and make our own clothes. We don't know how to even source fresh water and are thus being defiled. So back to the broader point, a man is not a man until he has basic skills under his belt with which to actually provide real necessities for real human beings. I also believe being cultured, yes. Having a cultural exposure, being educated, being scholarly and academic, being intellectually astute, these things, yes, they all should go together. It should be a full package. And likewise for women. A woman should be cultured. A woman should be well-studied and well-learned, well-literate and eloquent, articulate and intellectual, spiritually strong, um, as well as skilled. Again, in real life things, can you make some clothes? Can you really cook some food? Can you preserve some food? While we talking about food shortages at the grocery store, where are your mason jars full of preserved meats and foods and fruits? Where are your jar jars of ointment and healing salves and oils and tinctures? herbal medicines. How many women are skilled in these things? How many women are skilled in midwifery? How many women are skilled in how to set a broken bone? Lest their children or their husband become gruesomely disfigured for the rest of their lives and deformed from an injury. Yah forbid. Um, you know, these are just thoughts off the top of my head. But anyway, so our lack of proper orientation in proper cultural context and our ancestral traditions and values does us a great disservice in the modern era. And to go back to the idea of courtship versus dating, you know, this dating is happening much later than it would normally happen. And it's not being supervised by elders the way it used to be. There was a time where young men and women were prepared, as I've said, with practical real life skills and artistry And then they were supervised and ushered through the process of dating. They were introduced to different people of the opposite sex. 
to test the dynamics, to get to know themselves as they come into adulthood, know what they really like, who they really like, what really pleases them, with whom they are really compatible in personality and chemistry. Having real conversations, um, cultivating emotional intelligence through interactions with others of the opposite sex, understanding how to hold space, understanding companionship and what that feels like, and again, this experience of learning oneself through learning how you are with other people, that is dating. And it's necessary, but it should be done with wisdom and discretion. It should be done even, and especially with supervision by wise elders. Now courtship is an intentional process with the goal of marriage to assert and establish a security in the rapport by which both parties are made certain of the ability and capacity to support one another in a marriage. So a man will prove himself even financially to assure this woman, yes, I am able to consistently provide for you and our future children. He will also prove his emotional availability and intelligence, his capacity to support her emotionally through consistency in this process of courtship. It takes time to know someone. It takes time, and this is courtship, now, now, one thing I want to make clear right now, while it's fresh on my mind, you know, a lot of people say it don't take a man that long to know if he, he wants a woman to be his wife. And that's absolutely true. Men are very sure, very quickly, a woman that is worthy in his mind of being an actual wife. Um, and that doesn't take long at all. So the intention of courtship should then be established relatively quickly. Otherwise, you just plan. Now, moving forward, the process of courtship takes time. This is why even in Hebraic culture, there was betrothal. There was the intention being made known. There was the whole process of introducing oneself to one's family, making their intentions known for marriage, establishing certain exchanges and transactions of bride price and dowry and gift giving to, again, uh, show the ability to provide for this woman. And then you went on to the process of building and establishing oneself. Okay, so I had a little bit of an interruption. Let me try to gain back my train of thought. So coming back to this idea of the propriety of proper courtship, the respect of the family that the woman comes from, the respect of oneself as a man to establish oneself before you even dare to present yourself to this woman and waste her and your time. One thing that we are greatly deceived by is this diabolical um, institution of this birth control system and over-dependence on birth control. And I've even talked about elsewhere, this interesting statistical correlation between the increase in the use of various forms of birth control and actual sterilization and infertility in men and women as well as the increasing inability of women to achieve orgasm. The more you rely on contraception and inhibit the body's natural process of arousal that is functional really to enhance ideal fertility for conception, you know, 
you are inhibiting your orgasmic capacity. The pleasure of sex is for reproduction. That is our role as humans, to reproduce, to multiply, to be fruitful and multiply. Thus, the pleasure, the intricacies of pleasure are contingent upon opening oneself for conception. They go hand in hand. The deeper one is able to open oneself, the deep, the more deeply one is able to embody the body and open the body to enhance one's capacity for birth is enhancing one's capacity for pleasure. The more you resist conception by various forms, including the simple withdrawal method, you are greatly disrupting your orgasmic ability. But that's a conversation for another day that I've already had. We are greatly deceived as society by the over-dependence on birth control. Because quite frankly, we all as adult mature human beings know that whenever a man lays down with a woman, if she is ovulating, a pregnancy will occur. A child will be born. So the reality of that should be the contingency upon which that man and woman decide if they will embark upon an intimate physical relationship. And sexual promiscuity would greatly be reduced, if not completely alleviated, if we all were mindful of this basic human fact. So, if a man is reminded emphatically, dramatically, if you lay down with this woman, are you prepared to have a child? Are you prepared? Are you able? Are you capable of caring for a whole woman and child? It should be seen as inevitable. It should not even be a question. The choice to lay down with a woman should always come with the conviction that one is prepared to care for that whole woman and the child that will come from that laying down, period. Are you able to care for your child and someone else's? Because indeed, when you lay down with a woman, you have taken a child from her parents' home. You have taken a daughter and made her yours. Are you prepared to care for her the way her parents have? Are you prepared to maintain the quality of life her parents have given her by their sacrifice and investment? Are you prepared to equal that or better yet, more honorably, enhance that? Are you able to give her a better quality of life than even her parents? As a reward, out of respect for their sacrifice, their lifelong sacrifice for this child, so we have to think about, that's why courtship included the introduction to one's parents first. You do not lay down with a woman without introducing yourself to her parents. That's the first sign of respect. You do not sneak a woman, even if a man had, and see, that's another thing. So many, so many women have defiled themselves and have robbed themselves of their own sacredness and devalued themselves giving it up in the backseat of cars and in abandoned uh, apartment buildings and, and over here uh, sneaking little boys through their mama's bedroom window, through, you know, sneaking men through the back door when their parents not home. That is utter abominable dishonor. Because first of all, if a man even wants to lay you down, he better have his own house and bed to lay you in. There's an old saying our ancestors used to say, you ain't got a pot to piss in nor a window to throw it out of. 
do you at least have that brother before you dare to feel entitled enough to pull that thing out your pants? How dare you? Do you even have a pot to piss in and a window to throw it out of? Do you have your own home? Do you have your own bed to even lay that woman down in? And even if you do, are you prepared to show the respect to go to her parents? If you want her so bad, if you want her so bad, if she is just that desirable to you, then you should respect her enough because she is that valuable and precious to you to respect her honor and to respect her family's honor to then state your intention to make her your wife. Why would you occupy a body that you wouldn't make your possession forever? If you want her that bad, is she not a treasure that you would want to keep forever? Hmm. What is a temporary pleasure? If you wanted her that bad, would you want to keep her forever? So it should be natural to go to her parents and to be prepared to care for her, feed her, clothe her, and shelter her to the same capacity and ideally better to a better quality of life than her parents to honor their sacrifice. Because we have to think about the conversation between a man and a woman's father. Let's really think about this. Let's think about it. Let's imagine it. A man goes to this woman's father, having just slept with her. How dare you? Let's think about the father's perspective. I'm out here breaking my back. I'm out here literally killing myself every day to feed this child of my loins because she's mine. And you defile her for free? I put food in her mouth. And you just going to put your flesh in her mouth? I put food in her mouth every single day of her life. I risk my life to feed her every single day of her life. And all you got to offer her is some flesh to put in her mouth. And send her crawling back home, tiptoeing in shame with her pH balance off, smelling rotten, to still come and eat my food? Especially as black men, think about the black man as a father, what he goes through, the terrors, the traumas, the discrimination, the struggle, going out here to work every single day, getting up every day. That reminds me of a Bronx tale. The working man is the tough guy. Getting up every day, working a job you hate. Working a job where they disrespect you. Working a job where you ain't nothing but a number to them. Getting up every day, consistently working to put food on the table for my family. That's the tough guy. That's the hero. So this, this father risks his life every day to feed this daughter. And you can't feed her every day. You can't clothe her every day. You can't shelter her from the rain and the snow. The disrespect, how dare you?
you did not even deserve to pull it out your pants. And these are the conversations men need to be having with each other. The elder men need to be having these conversations with the younger men. Let alone <laughs> nowadays, if the woman has a single mother, oh my goodness. This woman disrupting all the natural order of the universe, literally. Going out to work and provide as a single mother, as a woman, masculinizing herself. The trauma of that alone, we are not built to work every day like men are, just by our hormonal feedback loop. That's why women experience burnout statistically far greater than men. We're not built the same. We're not wired the same. Our brains are not wired the same. Our hormones do not operate the same way. We don't have the capacity to produce every day to the same standard. That's why I personally don't believe in equal pay for women. Personally, I believe women should be home, maintaining homes, educating children. I don't believe in women in the workplace. I do believe in women having entrepreneurship. I do believe in women having real life skills as we talked about before and artistry to be able to trade. See, trade is different from work. Oh, you can sew some clothes? Yes, ma'am. Okay. We can trade for that. We can barter. We can even make a profit via currency for that. Yes, your skills and artistry should be paid for. If you if you are a beekeeper and you have beehives and you make jars of honey, hey, yeah, mm -hmm. go to the market and sell your honey, sis. Yep. If you can make body butters and oils, if you can make uh, hair products, if you could make natural beauty products without chemicals, you know, organic, holistic products. Yes, sis, mm -hmm. please do. We need you. We need you. We will trade for that. But trade is different from work. Work is for men by the sweat of their brow. Skills and artistry, craftsmanship is for women. That's another conversation. So I don't believe in women in the workplace. I don't believe it's fair to the men that women should get paid equally to them when women are literally not built to produce to the same capacity and standard throughout a whole month. Our brains change throughout the month. Our physical capacity changes throughout the month. So no, it's not fair that the woman gets paid the same rate throughout the month. A woman should get paid according to her productivity. If a woman, if a man can produce to 100% the same standard every single day consistently, and a woman changes from 100% to 70%, 60%, she having mood swings, she's emotional, she physically is going through menstruation and its pains, and, and cannot produce to the same capacity, then no, sis, it's not fair that you're getting paid the same rate as the man who is not going through that, who can still get up every day at the same time and produce to the same rate. I don't believe in equal pay. You should have stayed home. See, entrepreneurship is more suitable for women because there's flexibility and fluidity. You don't have to work if you're menstruating, sis. <laughs> Shouldn't that be ideal, the ideal model? But anyway, I digress. So, you know, God forbid that the woman has is, is raised by a single mother. Ooh. Please respect that woman's efforts. <laughs> How dare you? Say to a single mother who goes through a different sort of risk and trauma out there in the daily in the daily workplace to provide for this daughter and feed her and clothe her and shelter her every day. Are you just gonna sit her sit here and send her home wet and stank and defiled? No, sir. No, sir. 
God forbid you send her home pregnant? No, sir, that's not fair. That's dishonor. That's dishonorable to the highest degree. Are you prepared to pay this woman's medical bills or medical expenses? Are you prepared to be able to pay for this woman's um, medical treatments and medicinal remedies that she may need? Should you pollute her body in one way or another? You have defiled her. You have opened her. You have broken her flesh. And let's be clear. The first time a virgin has sex and her hymen is broken is not the only time that flesh is broken. In fact, every time a woman engages in intercourse, there are minuscule micro tears in the vagina. Blood vessels are broken. That's why sex is a blood covenant. DNA is being exchanged. Your blood, your bone marrow, your DNA is being seeped into her skin, into her bones, into her brain matter, into her cerebral spinal cord fluid. And you just going to lay with her and send her back home? You already won with her. You have literally already transformed her DNA. You are literally sending her home, not her parent's child anymore. Mm. Think about that. You have made her a new creature. That's not their child anymore. You have already started to change her DNA. That's not their child anymore. You have sent home a new creature. How dare you? You better keep her. So the reality is a man who lays down with a woman should be prepared and know the moment I lay down with her, I should already be prepared mentally, financially, emotionally, and spiritually to care for two lives, at least. To care for her as my own. Because I have taken this child from her parents' house and I have made her something new. And in addition I have created a new life within her that I am responsible for as the fruit of my loins. That's why virginity is the original ideal model. That's why monogamy is the original ideal model. This is why courtship and marriage is the model for humanity, the basic unit of community and society. So, I think I'll let that settle there for now and land there. I may come back later and do some more clarification on the delineation and distinction between courtship and dating. I think that's very important. As always, I pray that whoever was meant to hear this and receive it has received what they need from it. And those with ears to hear, let them have heard. Shema Yisrael. Shalom, shalom.